Okay, um, so this is another of the bite-sized bioinformatics um, sessions. Um, this one is a slightly impromptu session, so we haven't got lots of people on the call, uh, but a particular question came up uh, and it seemed like a good opportunity to address that. So in this session, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to look at how you can do quantitative gene set enrichment analysis um, with the tools that we provide uh, within SeekMonk. This is essentially going to be a walk through uh, an exercise that we do in our uh, gene set enrichment uh, analysis course, which goes into this and lots of other details, but this is kind of one little bit that we can separate out and uh, do in isolation. So if I just switch to sharing my screen, and that. Um, just to show where the data that I'm going to use today comes from, uh, this is part of our um, extracting biological information from gene lists course and in particular I'm going to go through the quantitative gene list practical or at least part of it um, to show how that works. Um, I've got a data set loaded in already so this is um, an RNA-seq data set where we're comparing two conditions, this ESC and IPS conditions. I've already done a standard RNA-seq quantitation um, and if I have a quick look at the comparison of the two in a scatter plot, you can see what this data looks like. So pretty typical um, pairwise comparison. We can see some genes that seem to be changing quite a lot um, but we also have a bunch of things that are changing by relatively small amounts. Now, in a data set like this, the conventional way that you would analyze it is that you do your normal differential expression analysis and you would pick out all of these genes that fall off the edge of the distribution. And those would form a categorical set of things that were interesting, okay? And we decide that those are interesting and everything else is not interesting. And we'd go and plug those into traditional gene set enrichment tools. So that will be things like, well, our favorite one that we normally use is a thing called G-Profiler, but David or Enricher or any of those sorts of tools, they all operate in a similar way. Where you put that list of interesting genes in and you see if functional categories of genes are enriched in that list compared to everything else that you decided was not interesting. That can work really nicely, but sometimes it doesn't. So the cases where it doesn't work nicely are firstly, sometimes you won't find any genes which are changing enough that they get picked out as differentially expressed. Statistical tests like differential expression are always a function of statistical power. So sometimes it can be that the changes that you've got are relatively subtle. So maybe you've got um, sort of a mixed population of cells, something like that, and the changes are happening only in a subpopulation. So the effect on the, the total signal is relatively small. Uh, and maybe that doesn't give you enough power to detect individual genes as changing. Um, sometimes it can be the other way that the changes are quite big, but maybe they're not very consistent across replicates. So you have a lot of variability. Um, so again, you may not pick this out. Under those circumstances, you don't have anything to work with or you don't have enough to work with um, to be able to do the categorical enrichment. So another way you can approach this then is by doing a quantitative enrichment. So this kind of turns the enrichment problem on its head. So instead of saying, I'm going to define which genes are interesting and then look for categories of uh, predefined functional sets of genes which might be enriched, you can directly test the sets of predefined uh, functional genes and then say, well, if I know that this set of genes is a connected set, so that these are all binding genes or DNA, um, things to do with transcription or whatever, I can test whether that set of genes quantitatively does something unusual in my data. And the advantage of that is that you're no longer relying on being able to identify a change in an individual gene. You can test the whole set all in one go. So the power that you have to detect changes um, goes up quite a lot. Okay, So even if your data is not amenable to you finding a change in an individual gene, because you're testing a set, you can detect more subtle behaviors in a set of genes than you could possibly have hoped to detect by pulling them out individually. So that's what we're going to do. 
So what does that mean in practical terms in here? Um, it means that we're going to look for genes which um, a set of functionally connected genes don't just position themselves randomly within this sort of scatter plot, that they're going to sit preferentially sort of towards one side or the other, or maybe they just sit away from the middle. Okay, um, and those will then be an indication that that set is functionally interesting, um, even if the changes are relatively subtle. Okay, um, just to go through some basics then. So, the statistics that we're going to use in here, there's a few different statistical tests that you can use, and the tests that you use are going to be dependent on the type of change that you think you're going to find. So there's two basic problems that we need to address. One is what the actual quantitative value that we're going to use is going to be. And the second is how we're going to plug that into what kind of statistical test to find um, a difference. So if I just switch across to, yeah. So if I just show a couple of examples. So. The first problem that we get is what metric are we going to use? So we could have run a traditional um, differential expression analysis, but without um, filtering for things that ex uh, exceed certain p-value limits, just give me the p-value for everything and use that to quantitatively rank the genes. Um, in this data set, we're going to use a simpler metric. We're just going to look at the difference in expression between the two gene sets. Okay, so that's just how far we fall from the diagonal on the scatter plot. Okay, so it's effectively like a fold change or an absolute difference. But a problem that we get with that is that those sets of differences have skews and biases in them. So you'll see um, if I look at this, that if I have a highly expressed gene, my differences in highly expressed genes are relatively small. They sit quite close to the line here. And if I have a lowly expressed gene, my differences are going to be very big. So if I'm trying to do a statistic on differences in this data set, I'm going to get biases in it because all the lowly expressed stuff is going to have nice big changes and all the highly stu expressed stuff is going to have small changes on average. So rather than just using the difference between the two, we're going to use a normalized version of that difference. And I'll talk about how that works in a, in a second. Okay, but that's the, the thing that we're going to use. So here we're going to use, um, well, either fold change or absolute difference. It's, they're very related in here, um, but we are going to apply a normalization. So in this case, we're going to apply a Z-score normalization to those to make those values fairer between genes which are lowly and highly expressed. Now, when we come to testing um, a functional set of genes, we take a set of genes. In fact, we're going to take lots of sets of genes, okay? Because we're going to pull out a database that has lots of different functional sets defined in it, and we're going to test all of them. We need to think about what sort of pattern of expression change we're expecting to see that we would consider to be interesting. Okay. Now, we can be really quite strict about this. So in this case, we can say, well, I want all of the genes in my category to change. I want them all to change in the same direction. And I want them to all change by about the same amount. Okay. So in here, the highlighted genes on here are a functional set that is super interesting. And you can see they all go up and they all go up by about the same amount. Okay. That's quite a harsh criterion. But if we can find it, great. In many cases, that's probably too strict, though. It might well be enough to say, well, what do I want? I want my genes to generally be changing, and I'd like it if they changed all in the same direction, so they're all going up. But it's unrealistic to think that they're all going to go up by the same amount. Okay? So I could set a requirement that these genes go up. So in here, again, you can see the highlighted genes. They're all going up, but some of them are going up loads. Some of them are going up only small amounts. Um, and that's okay, okay? So in, in real sort of functionally connected sets, it's much more likely that there's going to be variability in the level to which genes are upregulated or downregulated. The final way that we could think of looking at this is saying, well, if this is a pathway and we disrupt it, then it's not 
even likely that the whole pathway will go up or the whole pathway will go down. Depending on how we've disrupted it, we might find that a disruption in the middle of the pathway might cause some genes to go up in response, but others might go down. So the interesting thing is not that they're going up by a certain amount or that they're going down by a certain amount. The interesting thing is that they're not being boring and not doing anything. Okay, so just change in either direction might be interesting. So for example, a gene set like this, where, yeah, we can see that genes are going up and other genes are going down and they're going up or down by different amounts, but what they're not doing is sitting still in the middle could be the, the thing that we consider to be interesting. And which of those um, types of change we're looking for will determine the statistical test that we will use um, to do the analysis. So there are basically two types of tests that we're going to use. If we want things to change by similar amounts and in a consistent direction, we can just use a standard t-test, okay, because we're looking for the mean of the genes to be significantly different from zero in this case, which is no change at all, okay, which means that they're it's looking for things which are consistent and in the same direction. If we want to be more flexible, um, we can use tests which are happy to find things that change by different amounts. So the particular one we're going to use is the kolmogorov smirnov test. And all that does is it compares um, distributions. So it looks at the distributions of differences for all genes and the distribution of differences for your interesting set. And as long as those distributions differ at any point in any way, then that's enough for it to come back as significant. Finally, if we don't even care about the uh, values being uh, in the same direction, we can apply exactly the same thing for our kolmogorov smirnov test, but now instead of using that sort of quantitative value where we have positive values and negative values depending on the direction of change, we just take the absolute of those so that we say, well, let's just make everything positive. It doesn't matter whether it went up or down, it's just distance from the middle um, and apply the test on that, and that will then give us uh, a metric which we can use. So, that's kind of where we're headed with this. Um, the other component that we're going to need to be able to do this is that we need a set of genes to test. In fact, we need lots of sets of genes to test. Um, so in the end, um, we are going to need some kind of data source that will give us um, a functional set. So something that has an actual meaning to it. So it might be the name of a pathway or it might be um, a particular molecular function or it might be a biological process or whatever it is that it's going to be and then associated with that we need a set of gene names okay there are lots of databases that collate these types of um, sets so obvious ones will be things like the gene ontology which is very big but then you have pathway databases like sort of reactome or keg and lots of other sources okay there's more information in our gene set course if you want to go into where these come from we want to be quite broad in the things that we're testing. So in our case, uh, we are going to go and get a data set uh, from a public repository. And the particular place we're gonna get this from uh, is from a lab in Toronto. This is Gary Bader's lab that very helpfully collate a whole load of different data sources like this and make them publicly available and are a really nice source. Um, so um, I've gone here to betalab.org uh, slash gene sets um, and in there they offer for download um, gene sets which they update regularly from a number of different sources. The data set that we're using uh, in our example data is a mouse data set. So if I go and look at their download page here then if I get their current release and go to mouse then we want the symbol version of this which means that the thing that they're going to put on there is the actual gene names and they have a few different versions of this. Um, you can pick different ones of these, but the one that I would have taken from here uh, would be this one. So this is the mouse uh, gene ontology, biological, uh, biological processes and all pathways um, with gene ontology. Um, 
oh sorry the one above this one the one that says no gene ontology iea so iea is inferred electronic annotation so they're the less robust functional inferences so this is a more um, reliable but smaller data set of um, inferred functionality um, and it comes down as one of these gmt files um, i've actually got one of these downloaded already in the example data set so we have here this gmt file which is just a slightly older version than is on there now but it's exactly the same thing if i have a look at what's in there i've opened up a, the first few lines of this in an excel file you can see it's a pretty simple format all it is is a longer description um, a shorter description and then a bunch of gene names Okay, so these gene names have this functionality. Okay, that's all it is, but that's what we need for our test. These are the things that we can test. And what you can also see in here is that there's huge variability in the sizes of these sets. Some of them are huge. They will have hundreds, possibly even thousands of genes in. Some of them are tiny, uh, like this one here has only got one gene in it. Okay, so when we're coming to analyze this, we'll need to think about how we treat those. Okay, so we have a data set with a set of differences that we want to compare, and we now have a set of um, interesting sets of genes that we want to test. So let's put those together and actually run the test and see what this looks like. So this is going to be under the filtering menu in SeekMonk, and uh, it's a statistical test. And it's a subgroup test because we're going to test how interesting a subset of probes and probes in this case are genes are going to be and we're going to do a gene set enrichment. Now we've got a bunch of options here. Generally the options are fairly sensibly set. I'm going to tweak a couple of them but not because I have to just because I'm just sort of showing how this works. So the things that we need to set up we need to tell it what comparison we want to use as the basis for the test. So here I've got my ESC and IPS replicate sets um, at the top and bottom, and then I've got the individual BAM files that went into them. I want to test the overall comparison between the two. So I'm going to select to test from ESC to IPS. Okay, it doesn't matter which way around I do it, it's just gonna flip the direction, but the, the results will be the same. We then get to pick which test we want to use. So um, this relates back to what I showed just a moment ago in the graph. So what kind of expectation we have for the things that are different. So we could do a t-test. Um, the default is the KS test, the kolmogorov smirnov test, which is what I'm going to use. Um, but we could also do the non-directional kolmogorov smirnov if we were looking for things that maybe were disrupted in both ways. So this should give us a directional change, but without the expectation of um, an equal amount of change. We can set some filters then. So we can filter both the hits that we get back and we can filter the gene sets that we put in. Um, let's start with the gene sets. So uh, we're going to load our gene sets from a file. So if I select my file and on my desktop, I have this, I can go and select the GMT file. We then filter which, which lists that we test. Now, we want to do this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we don't want to perform more tests than we have to, because in the end, when we're quoting p-values, we're going to have to quote corrected p-value, which means that whatever the level of significance we get from testing an individual set, that won't be what we report. We then have to correct based on the total number of tests that we performed. Okay? And the more tests we perform, the less significant the results of any individual test are going to be because we have to correct against a larger number. So if there are tests that we can avoid doing that stand no chance of giving us a useful result, we're much better off not doing them. And the easiest way to reduce the number of tests that we do is to filter the gene sets based on the number of genes that are in them. Okay, so underneath here in this number of genes in category, we have a low and a high value on here. So the low value is there because if we have too few genes in our gene set, 
it doesn't matter how different they're going to be. If you've only got one or two genes there, you're never going to get a significant result for it because there just aren't enough observations for you to be sure that that couldn't just have happened by chance. So we're saying that as a minimum, we want to have 10 genes in our functional set. We're also going to set a maximum filter as well. So for the maximum filter, um, the reason for putting this in place is that if we test sets with large numbers of genes, so if we take a ridiculous one that's got like a thousand genes in it, then because our ability to detect a change is going to be heavily influenced by how many genes we have, we are more highly powered testing large sets of genes and what that means is we could end up getting really low p-values but from a really small absolute effect the the devia total deviation or the average deviation from zero might be really really small but because i've got so many genes it'll still come back as highly significant okay so we'll get lots of hits but they won't be very helpful also by the time you've got that many genes in a list you're not getting at anything that's vaguely specific in terms of its biology. Um, so it normally doesn't tell you very much, even if you do see the shift there. So you can play around with what values you have in here. Uh, the default is to go between 10 and 50, which is kind of fine. I mean, I'm going to take it down even a little bit more than that and say 10 to 40. So we're really only dealing with things that target quite specific uh, bits of biology. We're ruling out all of the large sets on here. The other things that we're going to change in here then are the cutoffs for the significance. So this is just of the tests that we do, which ones do we actually bother showing people? Um, and the two filters that we put on here uh, are the p-value filter. So at the moment it's p0.05, okay, pretty standard. I'm actually going to make it a little bit lower just to reduce the number of things that I look at. No real reason you could you could leave that at 0.5 just fine and then the average difference so this is sorry the mean difference on here so this is the magnitude of the effect so the first one is the significance so how consistent is it and the second one is the size of the effect so how big an effect is it and between those two um, you can sort of yeah get at the things that are most interesting we are definitely going to apply multiple testing correction um, so that what we've got is uh, useful this test will also do um, our z-score normalization so i'll calculate the results and then i'll explain how that works but let's go and actually run this test now so when i do this the first thing we're going to see is the results of the gene list filtering so it's read in all the gene lists so there are 22,000 gene sets in this file okay so it's a big file um, but we're only going to end up testing 5,000 of them okay so 4,000 had fewer than 40 genes in and huge numbers so tw nearly 13,000 12,800 of these had oh sorry other way around uh, 4,000 had more than 40 but nearly 13,000 had fewer than 10 genes in the set so there's an awful lot of functional sets that have really small numbers of genes in okay so excluding those has given us a real sort of boost to our power to detect Right, let's get it to go on and actually do the calculation then. So it's going to step its way through the gene sets, running the tests on all of those, and then it's going to bring up a visual representation of the data so that we can actually review these and see what we get. Okay, so here is our view. So we have two ways to look at the data that we're going to do. On this left hand side then we have a scatter plot of our comparison. So remember we tested EP, uh, ESC versus IPS and we can look at this either exactly the same as we did before with our sort of standard scatter plot, so ESC versus IPS, or we can look at the normalized values which were what we actually put into the test. Okay. Now, the normalized values, two things changes on this. Firstly, it changes from a scatter plot to an MA plot, which basically just an MA plot is just a scatter plot rotated through 45 degrees. So just imagine instead of the diagonal running bottom left to top right, we've just moved that point into the middle and made it go across. Okay, so that's one of the changes. The other thing is that we have normalized the differences. So what we've done is essentially to tweak 
the values of the differences here so that the width of this cloud of points is consistent across all expression levels. Okay? So what we do in practice is that for every point, we take a sampling of other points that have a similar expression level, and then we express this as a z-score. So we calculate the mean of those values, which is pretty much always zero because we're centered on zero, the standard deviation, which will be really high when we're in this low expressed region and will be really low when we're in the high expressed region. And we express the differences as standard deviations above or below the mean, which means instead of having something which starts off widely spread and gets narrower in the normalized data, it's about evenly spread across the whole expression range. Okay, so that's what we're actually plugged into the test and what we're actually looking for deviations in. Okay, on the right hand side then, um, we have a list of hits. So each one of these is a functional category that was read out of the uh, GMT file that we loaded in. And for each of them, we've got something that says, well, how many genes were in it? Okay, remembering that they're all going to be between 10 and 40. We have a z-score difference. So that's kind of what's the mean dif difference from this center line, either up or down. So like on this one, we can see the z-score is plus one. So that means that they will appear somewhere around this level in here. Um, we've got the original identifier and descriptions that we took out of the GMT file. And then we have two p-values, the raw p-value. So if we just had run that one test, what would our p-value have been? And then we have the adjusted p-value, which is a Benjaminian Hochberg nor, uh, corrected p-value, um, which is the one that takes account of how many tests that we've done. So this p-value will always be higher than that one, but this one on the end is the one that you should be citing if you're actually going to put this into um, your results. We can sort these lists on uh, either the mean z-score or the p-value. Let's start by sorting by the z-score so we can see the most interesting ones. Now, the things that are gonna be most interesting will either be at the top or the bottom of this list, okay? So you can see that here I've got the most negative Z scores, and if I go to the other end, I can see I've got the most positive ones. If I click on one of these, it will then highlight that list in here. I can use this little slider just to make the points a bit bigger, okay? But hopefully you can see all of these blue points are in this gene list, this cell migration list, and you can see the unusual spread of them. They're not just a randomly picked set across uh, the, the whole set of genes. They unusually skew towards being negative in here. So we've got one that's just about on the line, but every other point is negative and they're negative by different amounts but that's fine because this is a Kolmogorov Smirnov test it doesn't care it just means that they need to not sit on the line any of these others we should also see so here look there are even some positive genes in it but because there are so many genes in this set there are 22 genes in the set again it's unusually skewed low on the plot so that means that it comes out as being interesting and as we go further down we'll see the magnitude of effect gets smaller um, but we might see um, effects that still show that the genes are skewed below the line. If I go to the bottom end of this, or in fact, if I just sort it the other way, I can look for the same thing going the other way. So these are now positive z-scores. So if I click on this unwinding of DNA, I can see that the points in there are all now higher than the line all the way through, which means they're higher in IPS. All the others were higher in ESC, but we can again see lists that um, work out in the other direction. We could also sort on p-value. Um, so if I sort these on p-value, now I'm going to get a mix of things that go up or down. Uh, an interesting thing to note, if I sort on p-value and look at the z-scores, the z-scores here are nowhere near as high as the highest or lowest z-scores. And that in the end is because the p-value is also conflated with the number of genes in the set. So if you look at the most significant ones here, they're not ones that have a huge deviation, but they are ones that have quite a lot of genes in here. So remember, we only allowed it to have up to 40 genes, and the top hit here had 36, and they're not hugely skewed up, but 
they are consistently skewed up and there's a lot of them. So that gives you um, a very significant result. Okay, so again, you can see sets of genes that all appear to be doing something interesting. They, the way that it's presented in here, this looks like uh, a very interesting result, and it is. But if I go and back to the original scatter plot, you'll see that these are sets of genes that there's no way you would have picked those out as being individually interesting um, from a normal differential expression analysis. The magnitude of change of these is nothing special. Um, and it's only because we're analyzing them as a set that we think that they're interesting. If we just looked at any of these genes individually, there's nothing to them. It's the combined effect of the set that is the reason for doing this type of analysis and allows us to see more subtle effects. Um, as I go down here a bit further, um, we can see the first result that goes in the other direction. So all of these are positive Z scores. This is the first one with a negative Z score. Um, and we can start picking some of those out. So actually, it seems like the most significant results are all ones that go up in IPS, and there are relatively fewer that go up in ESC. So that's what the results look like. Um, I'll just go back and rerun the same thing now, uh, but using the other statistical tests. So that was using the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. I can just go back and change to the T test, leaving, leaving everything else the same and run it again. Um, and this should be a slightly more sort of stringent filter in that it's going to care more about the magnitude of change being consistent across a set. Okay, and again, if we look for these, many of these will be the same sorts of sets as we saw before, but the statistics will be slightly different and there should be more emphasis on the level of change being consistent. So here we only have a z-score difference of 0.6, which is pretty small, but it's quite a big gene set and they are quite consistent uh, with each other. So you can see there's fewer of those sets where you're seeing things falling right out here. Now they're all tending to be in the same sort of region. Um, any of these individual gene sets um, we can save. Um, so I can choose well I can obviously save the whole table so that would just save it out to a text file so if I want to put that somewhere else but I can also save an individual probe list if I want to go and examine that further. Um, what I can also do is to select a whole bunch of these lists um, so that I can look at um, them together. So one of the other problems that you have generically with gene set analysis is that there's a huge amount of redundancy within the databases that um, give you these gene sets. So here we can already see that some of these terms sound a little bit um, similar. So we've got DNA replication and we've got DNA strand elongation um, and maybe sort of extension of telomeres. I mean that's also a DNA modification um, and it's not unlikely that the same sets of genes or at least there's a huge overlap in the sets of genes that define these different categories. So what I'm going to do is to save a whole bunch of these. So I'm going to go down here and select a whole load of these. So all of the top hits off here. Let's just do the first page. Uh, and I'm going to save all of these. So save selected probe lists um, and say yes, gene set filter results. And now if I look back in my SeekMonk project, I've got a new set of gene set filter results and under there are all of the lists that I've just pulled out. Okay, and I can treat those like a no normal gene list uh, within SeekMonk and I can go and see what's in them and I can do anything that I would do with any other list. But I can also do one other thing which is really useful for interpreting this, which is that I can use a plot to look at the relationships between the genes in these different lists. Okay, so this plot is under the plots menu, um, under oops, probe list overlap. Uh, we can display this as a matrix, but we're actually going to do the probe list overlap plot. And this is just a graphical representation of the similarity of different genes, uh, gene sets. So if I select all of these, what I can then produce is this giraffe plot. And a giraffe plot is a plot where every dot on here is one 
gene set, so it's one probe list. So in this case, it's a functional set um, that I've selected from my quantitative analysis. Um, and then it draws lines between them and positions them so that things that are um, highly similar in terms of the contents of genes between them get placed together. Um, and now we can see that there's a whole bunch of functional um, sets in here that are very similar. So uh, processive synthesis on the lagging strand is very similar to lagging strand synthesis. Okay, makes sense. Um, is also similar to repair synthesis. Um, is also very similar to DNA replication, is also similar to the flap intermediate. So some of these would have been obvious from the names, but others wouldn't. Uh, then you can see there's some connection to other groups. So there's some overlap, but less um, similarity than we get in here. And you can start picking out, there you go, there's a set of mismatch repair groups, which have some re relevance to DNA replication, but are also containing a load of genes that are not similar. So it's a way of taking this larger and redundant data set and collapsing it down to, well, there's a set here and there's a set there and there's a set there and a set here. And then there's a bunch of things that really don't line up. So it's just a nice way to be able to sort of focus in on the biological themes that would have come out of this to again, try and help you understand what might be going on in there. Okay, that's probably a reasonable place to start with this. So hopefully you get an impression from that um, about how this works in general and how you might be able to use it um, for your own analysis. Okay, so let me stop that. So um, <laughs> of the one person that's in the thing, is there any questions uh, about any of that or are you kind of happy with that or has that sort of cleared things up a bit for you? Yeah, that's clear now. Yeah. Oh. Cool. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I will stop the recording at this point. Uh...